like to welcome you all to the Langley Adams Library in Groveland. Tonight we will be listening to Jeremy Detremont, who runs New England Lighthouse Tours out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, he's written nine different books and been on uh, Ghost Hunters mm -hmm. and um, Haunted Houses of America. Haunted Lighthouses, you yeah, all talk about that tonight. Excellent. And uh, so we're very glad to have him back again. Thank you, Diana. So we want to uh, get the lights lower, a little mood lighting here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be back here again. It's my third time at this library, and it looked like this might never happen, but I'm, <laughs> yeah. I was afraid I was going to run into a tornado on the way over here, but anyway, it worked out. So I, I recognize some of you from uh, my past uh, times here, so thank you very much for coming. Um, before I get into my, my stories of haunted lighthouses, I, I just want to say a little bit in general, um, and I usually start pretty much all my talks by talking about how people love lighthouses. It seem like, seems like wherever you go, people are very attracted to lighthouses. There's a certain romance about them, a nostalgia about them. And uh, you know, lighthouses, I would say, are, are one of the most used uh, positive symbols in our culture. It's no accident that churches and schools and all kinds of businesses use lighthouses as a positive symbol standing for uh, hope and faith and strength and guidance and steadfastness, and I could go on and on. There's all kinds of wonderful things that lighthouses represent, and I think that's very, very appropriate. Lighthouses are really built for nothing but, but positive reasons. But with all that said, uh, I like to say that there's another side to lighthouses that I like to call the dark side to lighthouses. Slight pun intended there. But, um, <laughs> And it just seems like there's something about an offshore lighthouse, a lighthouse off maybe on a rock or a small island far offshore, kind of sparks our imaginations. Uh, that's an aspect of lighthouses that I think has appealed to filmmakers over the years and writers. Uh, there's been some horror movies set at lighthouses. There's been uh, horror stories and novels set at lighthouses. It's not that well known, but uh, Edgar Allan Poe, probably our greatest writer of horror fiction, uh, was writing a po uh, not a poem, but a story about a lighthouse keeper when he died. When Poe died, they found fragmentary notes in his notebook. He was writing a story about an English lighthouse keeper off the, the coast of England in the late 1700s, and he was setting the scene. It was obvious. It was obvious something very creepy was going to happen to this, this lighthouse keeper, but we'll never know because he he died and he didn't finish the story, so we don't know what he had in mind. But you know, it is an aspect that's appealed to a lot of people, um, and I have no doubt that some of these stories, you know, there's no doubt that a, a lighthouse keeper or a, a keeper's, uh, you know, family living in isolated places like that through all kinds of conditions, I have no doubt that imagination played a part in some of these stories. You, it would be very easy to let your imagination run wild in, the, in these uh, situations. I also have no doubt that some of these stories can be at least partly uh, chalked up to embellishment. They were told, and these stories have been told and retold and written and rewritten over the years and passed down until it's hard to tell where, the, if there was any truth to the story, it's hard to tell where that leads off, leads off and the legend begins. Um, but uh, with that said, uh, I honestly believe there's something to some of these stories. Uh, I'm going to tell you some stories tonight that have been told to me firsthand by people who've experienced them in some cases. I'm going to tell you some of the legends too that are maybe questionable, but some of them have been, some of them have been told to me firsthand, and some of the stories I'm going to tell you tonight are things I've experienced myself, so I have to believe those. So I call, the bottom line for me is I call myself an open-minded skeptic. I don't believe every story I hear. I don't believe that every weird sound or thing I see is a ghost necessarily. But I think it's a big, my wife always says it's a big universe and we don't understand it all, whether right. we think we do or not. But anyway, so let me get into uh, some stories here. First lighthouse I want to tell you about, and in one of my other talks here, I talked a lot about uh, the history of Boston Light. I'm not going to give you the whole history tonight, but I, I, I apologize for those of you who are here before who might have heard some of this, but this is the first lighthouse in, uh, on the North American continent. Mm. Boston Light was established on a little island called Little Brewster Island at the entrance to Boston Harbor in 1716. Uh, and the man who was hired to be the very first lighthouse keeper in the North American continent was a man named George Worthy Lake. And he went out to live, he had grown up on uh, George's Island, one of the other harbor islands there. And he went to live at uh, Boston Light with his wife and two daughters in September of 1716. And poor George Worthy Lake had a, a pretty uh, short, miserable, tragic career as a lighthouse keeper, I'm afraid. 
Uh, for one thing, the, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts didn't want to pay him much of anything. They felt they were doing him a favor, giving him a place to live and letting him fish and everything. Um, so they paid him very little. So Worthy Lake had to do extra things to make ends meet, to feed his family. He, for one thing, served as a harbor pilot. He held vessels coming into Boston Harbor. He also had a flock of sheep. He had a flock of 59 sheep. And uh, very sadly, one day, uh, the tide was out. His sheep wandered out in a sand spit. Oh, and I probably don't even need to finish that sentence. <laughs> uh, and guess what happened next? The tide came in, and that was the end of his flock of sheep. So again, he had pretty lousy luck. Then in November of 1718, George Worthy Lake went into Boston to collect his pay. He went with his wife and one of their two daughters. And they were traveling in a sloop, probably similar to the vessel in this picture here. And they went into Boston, he picked up his pay. They picked up a family friend at one of the other islands on the way back to Boston Light. Then they anchored off of Boston Light. And I haven't mentioned it yet, but there was also a slave, an African man living on the island as well with the Worthy Lakes. So the slave uh, paddled a canoe out to meet the landing party and take them back to the island. Five people were in this canoe. Uh, Worthy Lake, his wife and daughter, one of his two daughters, the other daughter was on the island, and their family friend and the slave, five people. As they were paddling back, nobody knows why this happened. There was not a storm, or there were not especially rough seas or anything, but for whatever reason, the canoe capsized and all five people drowned. Mm. So this was, uh, it's still regarded as one of the worst lighthouse uh, tragedies in American history. It was big front page news of its day. This is the triple gravestone of George Ann and Ruth Worthy Lake in uh, the Copsole Burying Ground in Boston's North End. That's, I think it's kind of a spooky looking gravestone, those old death's heads with the skulls mm -hmm. were kind of spooky looking. Um, and uh, interestingly, the second keeper who went out to replace Worthy Lake also drowned after two weeks on the job. Oh, wow. So people started to think the island was cursed, but to the best of my knowledge, no keeper has drowned out there since then. Um, this Again, this was big news of its day. Cotton Mather, the famous minister in Boston, preached a sermon about it. Benjamin Franklin, who was 12 years old, lived in Boston at the time, wrote a poem called The Lighthouse Tragedy and sold copies on the streets mm -hmm. of Boston. So big, big news of its day. Uh, I want to tell you about something that happened in the early, skipping ahead to the early 1950s. There was a woman uh, by the name of Maisie Freeman Anderson. She was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper in Maine. She grew up at a couple of lighthouses in Maine. Later on, she married a Coast Guardsman, and he became one of the keepers at Boston Light in the early 1950s. Later on, Maisie wrote an article for Yankee Magazine about her life at lighthouses. And she said when they were at Boston Light in the early 1950s, she said on multiple occasions she would hear what sounded like a little girl sobbing outside. And she knew there was no little girl on the island. She would check around. There was nobody there. And she said not only did she hear this sobbing on numerous occasions, but often she would hear in between the sobbing, she heard the little girl crying, Shadwell, Shadwell. She had no idea what that meant. Later on, she did some research. She read about what happened to George Worthy Lake uh, in 1718. The slave, the African man who died along with the Worthy Lakes, was named Shadwell. Mm -hmm. So it was her assumption, and again, she, you know, she heard this without ever, ever having heard that before. It was her assumption that she had actually heard the little girl, the daughter of George Worthy Lake, crying out mm -hmm. at the moment that that was happening, and she was crying out for Shadwell, the slave. Skipping ahead to the early 1980s, I should say late 1980s, uh, Dennis Dever uh, looked like he was going to be the last lighthouse keeper in the United States. The Coast Guard was scheduled to automate Boston Light and remove the keepers by 1990. As it, as it turned out, they passed legislation to keep uh, a presence there, so there, are, there is still a keeper at Boston Light. I'll say more about that in a minute. But anyway, I, inter I interviewed Dennis Dever at the top of the lighthouse in 1989. I just want to play you a quick clip from that interview here. Uh, it's a nice environment uh, in the evening when the wind's howling, the snow's flying, and the, the sea's roaring against the, the rocks outside your window just to sit there uh, in the living room, maybe read a uh, Edgar Allan Poe book or something like that. That's what I enjoy doing. <laughs> Speaking of Edgar Allan Poe, those of you sitting near the speaker, sorry, I know it's a little loud and you're right next to it. <laughs> You'll be ready next time. Yeah, that's right. Um, Dennis told me a number of stories. He loved being a lighthouse keeper, and he also loved a good ghost story. And he told me that, that he and, I, and other Coast Guard keepers out there told me similar stories. They, a lot of them believed it was haunted, and they, would, they usually when weird stuff would happen, they would blame it on old George, meaning George Worthy Lake, the first keeper. Dennis Dever used to work in, uh, be working sometimes in this boathouse here, and he told me that he would have the radio on, and he would always have it on a rock station. And he said as he was working, the radio would mysteriously change itself to a classical station. Mm. And he would change it back, and he had this running battle going on with the radio. He also told me a very interesting story. This is, uh, 
By the way, this was June 2001. I got to uh, fly over the lighthouse in a helicopter. That was pretty oh, cool. Yeah. Um, and you see the keeper's house back here. That's where Dennis lived. Uh, and he was standing over the kitchen, standing by the kitchen sink. There was a, a window over the sink, looking out towards the lighthouse. So he's looking out the window, and he was absolutely sure he saw a man standing in the lantern at the top of the tower. He said it looked to him like somebody in an old-fashioned uniform. So he looked in the next room, as far as he knew, the only other guy on the island was right there in the next room, and he double-checked, and he saw that he was there. So he ran, Dennis ran out, and he could still see the man at the top of the tower. He went on the bottom and ran up the stairs, and nobody was there. And he insisted to me, he said, I'm not joking, I, I know I saw somebody up there. Uh, and uh, some of the other Coast Guard keepers uh, after him had similar stories. As I mentioned, the, uh, this was a, on a cruise I took in 2007, by the way. Um, the, uh, uh, as I said, the Coast Guard was going to automate Boston Light and remove the keepers, but then legislation was passed, led by Senator Ted Kennedy, to keep a human presence there. The Coast Guard stayed there for a number of years, but about eight or nine years ago, they decided to hire a civilian keeper because they don't really want to be paying full duty personnel to stay out there. So they have Coast Guard uh, Auxiliary Watch Standers, they're called. They're volunteers who spend shifts out there, and they also have a woman head keeper who is a civilian. Her name is Sally Snowman. That is how she pronounces her name. She is the, the only lighthouse keeper in the United States today, the only official lighthouse keeper still employed by the federal government. Sally's told me some interesting stories. She says that a number of the watch standers have experienced odd things out there. And the most common thing I've heard in recent years is that they uh, see a female spirit on the island. They say they see a woman in white, and some people have conjectured that she's the wife of George Worthy Lake, but I, who knows. Um, she's been seen at the top of the tower. It said that she's often seen around dusk looking out to sea, and also seen walking the paths at night on the island. And um, one story I heard is that one of the watchstanders was in the keeper's house at night, and there was a, a storm going on, and they were nervous about the cellar flooding. So they were sleeping on a couch <coughs> near the cellar door. They occasionally were getting up and checking the basement to see if it had flooded. Um, one of the times they got up, this person got up, as they walked towards the stairs, there was also a stairway going upstairs, and they saw a female figure coming down the stairs toward them. That apparently was an apparition. And this person said that as their eyes met, as this, this woman looked right at him, she suddenly disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the stories continue to come from Boston Light. A lot of the places I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to tell you about paranormal investigations that have happened, that have happened at them. This one, is, to the best of my knowledge, has not had an investigation. Um, I would like to see that happen, and I hope I can be part of it when it does happen. <laughs> this is one where I have been part of an investigation. This is New London Ledge Light. This is one of my favorite lighthouses uh, architecturally. I think it's just an incredible building. Yeah. Built in 1909 at the mouth of the Thames River, and that is how they pronounce it down there, spelled like the Thames in England, but they pronounce it Thames in Connecticut, um, between Groton and New London, Connecticut. And the first time I saw this, the first thing I thought of was like a mirage. You know, you don't expect to see a beautiful brick mansion like this out in the middle of the water like that. Um, they say it was built the way it was to be in keeping with the beautiful homes that people have on shore near there. But anyway, again, built in 1909, and this lighthouse has one of the most famous, maybe the most famous lighthouse or ghost story of any lighthouse in New England. I would say it's the most famous. Let me show you an old postcard of it. Here's how the story goes, and I'm going to tell you the usual legend that's told about this lighthouse without any guarantee that it's a true story, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to comment more on it afterwards. <coughs> they say that in the 1930s, a keeper went out to live at this lighthouse, and they said his name was Ernie. Uh, and nobody seems to know Ernie's last name, but anyway, Ernie the Keeper was living at the lighthouse with his wife, and they say his wife became very bored, which is not hard to believe. <laughs> so they say that one day uh, Ernie went away from the lighthouse and uh, had to do some errands or whatever. He came back and he found a note from his wife, and the note said that his wife had run away with the captain of the Block Island Ferry. <laughs> which is not that hard to believe either, really. The ferry goes by there every day, a couple of times a day. So anyway, I don't know if she just jumped on the ferry or what. But poor Ernie, they say, was distraught. Um, the story goes that he then went to the roof of the lighthouse and dove off to his death. And they say that Ernie left a note behind saying that he would curse the place forevermore because of the horrible thing his wife did to him. And there are many, many ghost stories at this place since then. There are variations in the story. Some versions say that Ernie got so drunk that he went to the roof and then fell off to his death. So it depends on what version you want to believe, or if you want to believe any of the versions. But in any case, uh, ever since then, there are just all kinds of stories about people exper experiencing strange things out there. 
Uh, in the, uh, I should mention the Coast Guard took over the management of lighthouses in this country in 1939. So uh, after 1939, there were Coast Guard keepers of the lighthouses. The civilians, the, under the old civilian lighthouse service, were given the option of finishing as civilians or joining the Coast Guard. But anyway, uh, the Coast Guard crews out at New London Ledge Light said that all kinds of weird stuff was happening. Their furniture would rearrange itself. Uh, the light and fog horn would turn off, on and off mysteriously by themselves. Their TV, in later days when they had a TV, that would just turn on and off by itself. Um, and just on and on. You know, again, it's hard, you know, there's a lot of stories, and I also have been told firsthand stories by the people who've been involved in taking care of this lighthouse in more recent years. As far as the Coast Guard stories go, it's hard to tell, you know, whether how much of it is true or not. But there's a lot, a lot of stories coming from this lighthouse. Um, there's also stories about a uh, supposed female spirit there. Uh, the treasurer of the New London Ledge Lighthouse Foundation, I talked to a couple of years ago, uh, the group that takes care of this lighthouse now, and he said one day he was there by himself. He was in the basement of the lighthouse, and he knew there was nobody else there, and he very distinctly, he told me he was absolutely sure of it. He, it was like a woman cleared her throat, like right in his ear, like she was right in back of him. Mm -hmm. And he turned around quickly, and there was nobody there. But he said he wasn't his imagination. He knows he heard it. Um, so, and some people blame some of the stories on supposedly a, a sailboat wreck near the lighthouse in its early days. So, but there doesn't seem to be any documentation about that, about a couple of people dying in a wreck there. In any case, there have been uh, quite a few investigations, paranormal investigations of the, this lighthouse. I don't know how many of you know the show Ghost Hunters on the Sci-Fi mm -hmm. Channel. Mm -hmm. They spent a night there a few years ago. Uh, nothing happened when they were there, so that was kind of boring. <laughs> but um, another show called Most Haunted that's on the Travel mm -hmm. Channel, it's a group of English ghost hunters. They uh, spent a night there, and it's on YouTube if you want to look it up. They had some stuff happen where one of the guys was whistling he kept repeating a certain whistle, like two or three notes, and every time he did it, it sounded like the same whistle being repeated from somewhere else in the lighthouse, and they swore it wasn't one of the crew or anything. It was just they couldn't figure out where it was coming mm -hmm. from. And some lights came on by themselves. You know, a few different things happened. So if you feel like searching on YouTube, you can probably find that. Um, in 2006, uh, I got to be part of an investigation of this lighthouse. Uh, it was, first of all, the people I went out with uh, were a group called New England Ghost Project. And I'm going to talk about New England Ghost Project quite a bit tonight. Um, this is not the greatest picture of most of these people, the guy, but you'll see some more pictures of them. The guy on the left here, who you'll see in some other pictures, is Ron Kolek, who founded New England Ghost Project. And he's done hundreds of investigations. He lives in Drake at Mass. And he does a lot of lecturing. He has a couple of radio shows. He's written a couple of books on the paranormal and so forth. So he's pretty well known. Uh, the woman with her back to us here is Karen Mossy, who is the EVP expert, and I'll be explaining what EVPs are in a couple of minutes. And the woman sitting on the floor here is Maureen Wood, um, who is the resident psychic medium of New England Ghost Project. And she is also what's called a, tra a trance medium. And when Ron explains it, he always says, uh, asks people if they've seen the movie Ghost. If you've seen the movie mm -hmm. Ghost, the Whoopi Goldberg character mm -hmm. is a trance mm -hmm. medium. The basic idea is that the spirit enters the person and actually speaks through them. Um, I, I went into this, you know, some years ago when I first got involved in this kind of thing very skeptically, and I'm still skeptical. I think it's healthy to be skeptical. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that all, all psychics are for real, but I, I will tell you that I've taken part in a number of investigations with Maureen. I've gotten to know her pretty well personally. I have absolutely no doubt that she's 100% sincere. She's not acting. You can, you know, decide for yourself what's happening, but it's not acting. It's not, it's not being made up. I know that for a fact. And I've seen, and I'll tell you a couple of interesting <coughs> stories about it tonight. Um, so, and this investigation was also shot by a TV crew for a show called American Builder. It's on the Comcast, it's on Comcast cable. I don't mm -hmm. know if any of you know American Builder. I think okay. it's still on. Does anybody know for sure? I think it is. I think it's on every day, actually, but I forget what channel that is now. It used to be called CNE. Oh, it's, um, uh, it's channel six on our local, okay. it's a news channel. Uh-huh, yeah, and that is, it's, it's still on every day, I think. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you. Anyway, it's sort of a home improvement kind of show, uh, kind of like this old house. They decided to do a Halloween special on the Haunted Lighthouse. So they sent out this guy who you're going to see in the video clip I'm about to play. The guy on the far right here is uh, a young guy named Jimmy who's one of the hosts, who's one of the hosts of the show. So he went out with us. Uh, New England Ghost Project doesn't normally use a Ouija board investigations. They decided to do it this time because it's something very visual. They thought it would be good for the TV show. Plus it was something Jimmy, the, the host, could take part in as well. So that's why they, they brought that out. This is Jimmy here. I'm going to play you a video clip from the show that they did. It's actually, actually won a regional Emmy a few years ago. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and play this, and then I'll tell you more about it. 
This might be a little loud when it starts. <laughs> Do you want us to leave? That would be a big yes. Well, we have no way to get out of here, so we have to stay. Who are you? It's almost kind of like a warning, though. A warning? Yeah, like a... Um... Who is here with us? Is there anyone with us? Uh, yeah. Why are you here? Uh, yeah. Do you like this here? Do I interfere? Please leave. Please leave now. Do you know you are dead? It's time for you to go. Someone else here. Someone else here? We got a new visitor. Who is here with us now? You lie! You lie! You lie! So angry. They left me. Where? Outside. Top of the. Are you on the roof of the lighthouse? Yeah. Are you on the roof? Let me down! Let me down! They left you up there on the roof of the lighthouse? It was an interesting night. I probably don't need to, <laughs> to say that. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, on that. Um, first of all, there's one point where Maureen kind of turns and looks at Ron, and it's like Maureen isn't home at that point. That's that's not Maureen mm -hmm. looking at him. It's like it's somebody yeah. else entirely. Wow. Um, I've seen her come out of this state a number of times. When she first comes out of this, whenever she does the channeling like this, she looks like her eyes are coming from a million miles away. And Ron likes to say that she looked like her eyes could eat a hole through your soul, which is an interesting way to put it. Um, <laughs> And um, I'll tell you, uh, she's hold you see they're all holding hands there, and Jimmy, this young, strong guy, this uh, construction worker, is holding one of her hands, and he said he couldn't believe he re she really hurt his hand. He's probably a foot taller than her, and she squeezed his hand so tight that it really hurt him, and he couldn't believe it, how strong you know, she was at that point. Um, so, uh, basically, uh, I, don't, I probably don't need to say that Maureen felt that a very angry male spirit was speaking through her. And... You know, some other interesting things happened that night. This was sometime in the middle of the night, but that, what I just showed you is probably the highlight of the night. Um, I'm going to play you a couple of sounds that are recorded too, but here are Ron and Maureen about 6 a.m. when we're waiting, waiting for the boat to take us back. You can see how tired they look. It was a long night. Mm -hmm. uh, some, sometime in the early morning, we uh, decided to try to sleep for a little while. I think about 6 a.m. or Five or something. I went into one of the rooms and there was no furniture there at the time. I just uh, laid on one of the, on the floor and there were spiders everywhere. <laughs> so I didn't get any sleep at all. So anyway, it was foggy in the morning. You kind of see out the windows. It was completely foggy, um, which seemed fitting somehow. But anyway, so they were exhausted. But Maureen came up with some very interesting conclusions based on what she was able to pick up there. She felt that the spirit that was speaking through her, this angry male spirit, was not a lighthouse keeper. She feels that he's a he was a construction worker, and he was actually there as part of a crew during doing work on the lighthouse, and that the other workers locked him out on the roof as a prank, and that he was trying to get back in, and he slipped and fell to his death. Wow. So, um, you know, if you, if you remember in that clip, she was saying D down, down, then she was holding her head because she felt he had a head injury. That's why she was holding her head. She felt pain in her head. Um, she feels that he's very angry because his death was covered up at the time, and also, uh, because everybody has the story wrong, everybody thinks it was a lighthouse keeper. So, you know, we're never, probably never going to be able to prove what she said, that that might be true. But to me, it actually is more believable than the lighthouse keeper story. Because if a lighthouse keeper, as recently as the 1930s, committed suicide out there, there'd be some sort of record of it. Nobody's ever produced a newspaper article or any sort of, you know, official record of that happening. Um, so the construction worker thing and maybe, you know, being <coughs> covered up um, actually is more believable. But well, I guess we'll never know for sure. Um, 
I don't know if any of you watch the paranormal shows on TV, you know, probably know what EVPs are, but basically EVP stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. The basic idea of EVPs is that these investigators in a supposedly haunted place will use a, a recorder. Usually these days they use a little digital recorder, looks something like this. And they will sometimes just let it record for a long period of time, or sometimes they'll ask questions in the recorder. They might say, are you here, or is there anybody there, or whatever it might be. And often when the recordings are played back, even though nothing is heard audibly at the time, when they're played back, sometimes you hear voices on the recordings. Uh, and there's different theories about this. The, the, usually, the usual theory is basically that the spirits, or whatever you want to call them, can actually manipulate the white noise on a recording and, and create a voice. I, I don't know what the explanation is, but I've heard very compelling EVPs in a number of cases, and often they really seem to be an answer to questions being asked. Um, so I'm going to play you a couple of EVPs that were recorded that night in New London Legislature. This first one was recorded by Karen Mossy of New England Ghost Project. And you're going to hear her say, are you here, yes or no? And you'll hear something else after that. Are you here, yes or no? <laughs> Again, that, so it sounds like a gruff yes to me, like pretty fast, yes. Um, that was not heard audibly at the time. It's only heard when the recording is played back. Mm -hmm. This next one was recorded by Karen outside very late at night. And it was recorded at the top of the stairs, like on the pier out here. And she is, you'll hear it sounds like sort of a raspy, whispery kind of voice, and she feels it's saying, help me, I'm cold. So. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, there are different classes of EVPs. They talk about class A, class B, class C. Class A is where you play it, and everybody in the room would hear the same thing, and there'd be no doubt about what it's saying. Karen actually recorded a famous one that she believes is her father, who had died saying I love you, and it was used in the movie called White Noise with Michael Keaton, I don't know if anybody saw that, but um, class B is where some people might hear it, but there'd be some disagreement, a class C is where it's kind of open to conjecture what it might be saying. I call that maybe a class B, this one. Um, this one you hear Ron Kolek's voice saying, do you like us here, followed by something else? Do you like us here? I think that's fairly clear, <laughs> like a whispery yes. Okay, I'm going to move on to another lighthouse now, uh, moving up the coast a little bit. This one is in Newport, Rhode Island, Rose Island Light. This is one of the lighthouses where you can actually stay overnight, and it's a really beautiful place. And it's so popular, the overnight stays there in the summer are so popular that you have to book about three or four years in advance. You can, anytime you want in the winter, you can go out there, but in the summer <laughs> it's, it's tough to, to, to get a, a reservation. They actually have a, a renovated upstairs, kind of a modernized apartment upstairs where you can stay for a week and they call you the keeper for the week and they give you chores to do. Everybody loves it. Um, downstairs they have a couple of bedrooms you can rent by the night. And there's also like a museum on the first floor. It's just a wonderful place. I've been going there, I've been there many times over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, and it has some ghost stories, which is why I'm talking about it tonight. Uh, Dave McCurdy uh, is the current director of the Rose Island Lighthouse Foundation, and he and his wife have stayed there overnight a number of times, and he's one of many people, and his wife, who have heard footsteps on the stairs, doors opening and closing when nobody is there, and, you know, a lot, a lot of the sort of common type of thing you, you think of with, with hauntings or whatever you want to call them. So he firmly believes the place is haunted, and for different reasons, he thinks it's a particular keeper, I'm going to tell you about it in a minute, a lighthouse keeper who is haunting the place. Um, this is the group that went out uh, March of last year, uh, New England Ghost Project, actually a big group went out there. I'm back here, there's Ron Kolek, his son Ron Jr. here. The guy with the sunglasses on back here is Tom D'Agostino, who's written a number of books on haunted places in New England, so it was neat having him along too. We probably have some of his books in the library here. Yeah. Um, so we went out and spent an entire night there. Uh, and this is Charles Curtis, the keeper who uh, Dave McCurdy and some other people think is the usual suspect for haunting the place. And that's, that's often the case with these lighthouse hauntings. People often think that it's a lighthouse keeper haunting the place. To me, you know, if you buy in, into the idea of, of hauntings of any kind, then to me it's not that big a stretch that there could be lighthouse keepers. If you think of at least some hauntings being a case where people are so emotionally attached to a place that they have trouble leaving even when they die, to me, that makes perfect sense that a lighthouse keeper would, would fall into that category because lighthouse keepers were so attached to their lights, to the, these places. He lived at this uh, lighthouse for over 30 years. 
think it was 1887 to 1918, there were some of them who lived at one lighthouse for you know, 30, 40, 50 years. They were very emotionally attached to the places. Um, so it makes sense to me they might have trouble leaving even after death. Um, Ghost Hunters uh, did a show uh, at Rose Island Lighthouse uh, not too long ago, a couple of years ago, and uh, this picture was shown in the Ghost Hunter show. This picture was taken, this is a painting on the wall in the first floor of the lighthouse. And this photograph of the painting was taken by a guy staying there a couple of years ago, and is obviously a flash picture, and you see the reflection of the flash mm -hmm. on the glass here. He swears that when he took the picture, there was nothing but blank wall behind him, there was nobody standing near him, nobody else in the room. So you see the reflection of the flash here. The interesting part of the picture is down here, mm -hmm. and it, it seems odd, so I'm gonna, I cropped it, and I'll show you what it looks like close up. It's on the left there. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem logical that that would have come from the flash, and, or it, it doesn't look anything like the guy who took the picture. Um, so it's certainly intriguing. Um, Dave McCurdy thinks it's a picture of Charles Curtis, that he actually captured him there. I'm not convinced of that. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. You can draw your own conclusions. Uh, the hairline certainly looks different. Maybe it's him at a different point in his life or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'll also say that, uh, and I, I don't think it's any big news, that there's a human tendency to kind of try to make, to make sense out of chaos. You want to, you, we read things into mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. People see Elvis and a potato chip or whatever yeah. it might be. <laughs> um, so, you know, there might be some of that going on. It may be just a play of light and shadow that suggests a face to us, but it certainly looks like a face. Mm -hmm. um, before I, I'm going to say a little bit more about Rose Island before I move on. The most interesting part of our investigation there happened late at night. We did something called table tipping or table mm -hmm. tilting. Mm -hmm. Some of you even know what that is. If you've ever taken part in seances or uh, paranormal investigation, you might have done some of that or been fam you're familiar with it. Um, the basic idea is that people will sit around a table, put their fingertips on the table, and, um, and ask spirits to come forth and, and make themselves known by moving the table. And, <coughs> Uh, fairly early in the night, three of us, Ron Kolek of New England Ghost Project, Dave McCurdy of the Lighthouse, and I sat around a small table on the first floor, little end table kind of thing on three legs, maybe this high, and we all had our fingertips very lightly on it, and I was watching to make sure nobody's legs were touching it or anything. Ron Kolek said, if there are any spirits here, as long as you mean us no harm, please let us know you're here by moving the table. After, I'd say no more than a few minutes, uh, you could feel like a fine vibration. It was like the table was, 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 was vibrating. Um, after a few more minutes, I say within 10 minutes from the time we started, the like one leg would go up and start to really move around. And after 10 or 15 minutes, the table was dancing around. Um, I've I run swear. out. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't believe it if I wasn't there. But um, at one point, it was moving like in a, a circle, like a clockwise circles, going boom, 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 and it came around and it went right up against my chest. And I was, I was, I wasn't really scared, but. Borderline scary, I would say. And I actually said, please, please don't hurt me. I said it in sort of a half kidding way, you know, like, please don't hurt me. And Ron will let me live that down. He always tells people. And then, and then Jeremy said, please don't hurt me. <laughs> but anyway, that's about as close as I've come to actually being scared in one of these investigations. But it didn't hurt me. But it was interesting, to say the least. And then later at night, about 2 a.m., eight of us sat around this big, heavy wood table up in the kitchen, a big, heavy oak kitchen table on the second floor, and we tried table tipping with that. And we, Ron and I were very skeptical because the table was so big and heavy, we didn't think it would work. But eight of us sat with our fingertips touching the table. Again, I made sure nobody's legs were touching it. And the same thing happened. After 10 minutes, this big, heavy table was boom, 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 boom. boom. Wow. It was jumping around, oh, I swear wow. to you. And, and you don't have to believe me, and I know it's hard to believe, I wouldn't believe it either, but wow. um, that table was absolutely dancing. Um, wow. It seemed like we were getting kind of silly and laughing as it was happening, until, and you know, people were, were, it was so amazing that we were laughing and clapping and stuff, and it seemed like the more noise we made, the more it was jumping around. And Ron says that that happens sometimes, it sort of feeds off that energy or something. So. Um, the, the you know went on for a good several minutes of this really really bouncing around. At the end of it, the, the, all the joints in the table were loose. It was very tight Whoa. when we started, and we checked it later after a, a while after we stopped, and it had like tightened again on its own. <laughs> but when we first stopped, it was very loose. Wow. So I don't know. You know, to me, either either spirits were moving that table, or our own subconscious minds were somehow moving the table. And either way, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so. Do you, do you
Did yes. you have any doubt that that was a face in that picture? Um, that, uh, yeah, I, I doubt it. I, 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 I don't know. I have an open mind on it, but I'm not convinced that I'm seeing a face when I look at that, that reflection. Yeah. I just think it's it intriguing. So like a I think it does look a lot like a face. I'm, I, I just, I, I think I'm skeptical by nature, so I don't automatically, I'm not saying. What else could it be? Well, it just, looked just a play of light and shadow that suggests a face, but I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> I'm saying I don't know, basically. It's, it's certainly interesting. Um, this lighthouse uh, is uh, not too far from uh, Newport, not saying part of the world, right on the border between Massachusetts and Rhode Island in uh, Mount Hope Bay near Narragansett Bay. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows that area, Fall River. It's uh, near the mouth of the Taunton River. This is called the Braga Bridge, B-R-A-G-A, in the Fall River. And this is a type of lighthouse that is often referred to as a spark plug type, type of lighthouse. Uh, it's a, or a caisson light, basically the caisson uh, is sunk down into the bottom and then filled with concrete and the lighthouse is built on top of that. This lighthouse was damaged badly in the hurricane of 1938, so the government put a wider case on around it to protect it. But you can actually see it has a bit of a tilt from the hurricane of 38. When you're inside it, you see the tilt very plainly. Um, this is one of the lighthouses that has been sold in recent years to a private owner. The government, the federal government is basically getting out of the business of taking care of lighthouse structures. Um, so under the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000, they're giving away lighthouses each year, several lighthouses each year to nonprofits or communities. If they don't get any good applications under this program, they auction the lighthouses to the high bidder. A couple of years ago, this lighthouse was auctioned to the general public and it was bought for $56,000 by this guy, uh, Nick Korstad. He's from Oregon. He's 31 years old and he loves lighthouses. Uh, so he, he bought this lighthouse for $56,000. At this moment, although, as, as of last week anyway, he was living inside the lighthouse. I think he may have moved out for the winter. <laughs> he mentioned on Facebook last week that he could see his breath and, and bed, so it's it was getting to be that time, and he's going to have to get out of there. But he has done a wonderful job there. I went out with him uh, just after he bought it, and the place was in terrible condition inside. He's done wonders with the place. Uh, here are a couple of rooms oh, inside. Nice. Oh, beautiful. Um, Cozy. And it's very cozy, and I, uh, I don't think he minds me telling you that um, every, virtually everything in there was bought from Goodwill. So he hasn't spent a ton of money on it. He's been, you know, been very thrifty about it, but he's done a great job. It looks really nice, and he plans to open it next year as a B and B. But to get in there, you have to climb off the boat and up the ladder up the, up the side there. So it's not for everybody, but it's, it's pretty neat. And he feels very strongly the place is haunted. Um, here are some pictures from his website. Uh, the upper ones show a couple of the, the floors inside the lighthouse before he put all the furniture in. And he refers to these as orbs. Again, those of you into paranormal stuff have know that term. I'm not a big believer in orbs. Basically, uh, some people feel that these, these little circles that show up in, in some pictures are a form of paranormal activity. Um, I don't think so, at least in most cases. There may be some that are questionable, but uh, I think they're generally uh, moisture or dust, uh, and they only seem to show up when you, with like point and shoot cameras, the a more expensive SLR type of camera won't pick up those things. But anyway, but that's, that's not all the evidence he has. Uh, this, this picture down, these pictures were taken, he said, right back to back within a couple of seconds of each other, and the, it's a flash picture, but for some reason this area where it looks like the flash would be mm -hmm. filling up, there's like a weird shadow there. But Nick has had a lot of strange experiences there. He says that he and other people visiting have heard on multiple occasions, many occasions, a little girl's voice, often giggling, like a little girl giggling. One time he was doing some painting there, uh, and he's some of the what he's he, he painted that red stripe on the lighthouse and never had a red stripe before. So he's done some kind of unorthodox things. He's painted the finials at the top green. He's done some things that are not quite. <laughs> like it was historically. But anyway, he was doing some painting one day, and he said he heard the little girl's voice right in his ear say, those colors are cute. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows what he heard. Um, also, he and a number of other people have heard what sounds like a man whistling fairly often out there. His, bro his brother has helped him there at times, but he says his brother, his brother won't go back again because he feels the place is so haunted. Um, so, uh, what was I trying to think of? Uh, oh, I know what I wanted to say. As far as the little girl and the, the man whistling, um, he met a local man who told, told Nick that there was actually a boat wreck near the lighthouse quite a few years ago where a man and a little girl were killed. Oh. 
Oh, so that kind of added up with some of the stuff he's experienced. So very interesting. So um, this is just a month ago. Just, uh, I think, a little over a month ago, uh, New England Ghost Project and I went out to do an investigation. Uh, and this is Nick, the owner here, and Ron Kolek, and uh, two other members of New England Ghost Project. It was just a small team because it's not a very big space, so Ron didn't want a big crowd there. This is Leslie Marden in the red sweatshirt. Um, she is another psychic medium. She is not a trance medium like Maureen, so she, does, she doesn't speak as if she's somebody else, but I've seen her come up with amazing things. And the woman on the right here is Karen Ruck, uh, another member of the group who doesn't call herself a psychic, but she considers, considers herself sensitive. And I've seen her come up with some really interesting observations as well. Um, early in the evening, Leslie, they both, neither of them did any homework at all. They didn't want me to tell them anything about the place. That's usually the case with these, these people. They don't want to know going in. Um, but early in the evening, Leslie said, I'm, I'm getting the name uh, Jean-Paul, like a French name, Jean-Paul, for some reason. And I wanted to tell her, but she said, don't tell me now. I wanted to tell her that one of the longest serving keepers of that lighthouse for about 15 years was John Paul. J-O-H-N, first name John, last name Paul. Um, and uh, also, uh, both she and Karen were getting a very strong impression of a man with a mustache and like a captain's hat. And they both drew pictures of him, and the pictures were kind of similar. And in my pocket, and I didn't show them until the end of the night, I had printed out pictures of two of the keepers, including John Paul. They basically drew John Paul, and they swore they you know, hadn't done any homework or anything. Um, <coughs> Leslie also said she kept feeling a pain in her abdomen. And it was a story that I didn't even know, but Nick knew about it. There was one keeper there who had appendicitis, and he almost died. He didn't die of it, but his wife had to fly a distress signal for several days before they finally came and picked him up, and he almost died of appendicitis. And she was getting a strong pain in her abdomen, so it seemed to relate to that. So it was a very interesting night. We, we stayed until about 1.30 a.m. This is about midnight. We're on the third level of the lighthouse, and this is in complete darkness. I took this with a flash picture. Both Ron and Karen here are dowsing, using different methods. Dowsing is something else that's done in paranormal investigations. Ron is using a pendulum. Can't quite see the whole pendulum here. But he'll ask yes or no questions with a pendulum. He'll say, what is a yes? And might do a clockwise circle. What is a no? What is a maybe? Kind of like the tradition of holding a pendulum over a pregnant woman's mm -hmm. stomach to see whether it's a boy or a girl. And he often gets very interesting, interesting results doing that. Karen is doing dowsing using L rods or dowsing rods. And she was asked, also asking yes or no questions. Both of them are getting very strong, seem to be getting very strong results that imply that there was a, a male uh, spirit there. Um, as we're doing this, all of us are on this one floor. As we're doing it, um, it sounded like footsteps upstairs from us, like boom, boom. There was nobody up there. Hmm. So Ron and Karen and Leslie went upstairs to check out what was going on. Nick and I stayed on this floor, and as we're sitting there, and there are the, the other ones are upstairs, um, Nick suddenly said, did you see that? And I said, what? I was looking the other way. And he said, a light just shot across the floor. And it seemed to have no source or anything. The light just moved across the floor. Seconds after he said that, uh, there was like a, a thud on the side of the room, kind of near him, that seemed to have no source, like boom, just a hmm. quick noise. It was just a second after he saw, the, saw that light, a few seconds. And also, Ron had left a, a little gadget called uh, a shack hack. I always forget if it's hack shack or shack hack. Shack hack. It's a, thing, it's a disabled uh, radio scanner, so it constantly cycles <coughs> through the radio stations. Hmm and you'll hear bits of voices from different shows and stuff, and the idea is that you can ask questions and supposedly you'll get voices that may answer your questions. I'm not a big believer in it, but anyway, that was running on the floor, so Nick saw the light and then there was this thud, and the second after the thud, the Hack Shack thing said, protect your home, very clearly. There hadn't been anything clear coming out of it in quite a while, so they said, protect your home, which I thought was kind of interesting. Wow. So a little while later, the other three came down from upstairs, and all three of them, Maureen, uh, not Maureen, uh, Leslie, Karen, and Ron all said they heard a male voice while they were upstairs, and they heard, they heard like a groan upstairs, which is kind of creepy, and I guess it's a tr traditional thing that a ghost is supposed to do, but they heard like, oh, you know. They couldn't tell where it was coming from. They thought it was above them in the lighthouse, but they couldn't tell for sure where it was coming from. But all three described the, the same thing, and they were totally serious about it. Um, so it was a very interesting night. More happened, but i got to go on. i got a couple more lighthouses to tell you about. Um, Owl's Head Light, a couple of us were talking about it earlier. This is uh, one of the most beautiful lighthouses in Maine. This is in Midcoast, Maine, near Rockland, to the entrance to Rockland Harbor. 
It's a short little brick lighthouse, as you can see, but it's up on a bluff, so that the light is 100 feet above the water. And it's a very picturesque place. And here's a, an old aerial picture showing the keeper's house. There's a, a walkway and stairs going up to the lighthouse, a little oil house where they used to store kerosene. This is one of the keepers there. I'm just showing him as an example of a keeper there. His name was George Woodward. He was there in the 40s. Uh, and this is another place where a lot of the things that happen seem to point to possibly a keeper haunting the place, but nobody seems to know who he is. Uh, I was there, I've been there many times over the years, but uh, one of the first times I went there was, I think, in 1988. That's when this picture was taken. This is Mac Rouse, who was the last keeper. They were automating the light at the time. Believe it or not, that's me. <laughs> a mere, uh, what's that, 24 years ago, a few uh, pounds of hairs ago. <laughs> but anyway, so um, uh, Mac Rouse was the first person to tell me the place was haunted. He said that he, um, he's one of many people who've experienced a, a certain thing where uh, he would get up after a snowfall, he'd go outside, and he would, let me go back here, he would see, um, like, Footprints that seemed didn't come across the grounds at all. They would just start on the walkway and go up the stairs, these footprints in the snow, and they would end at the lighthouse door and not go anywhere from there. So they seemed to have no, they didn't start from anywhere, they didn't go anywhere when they, after the door. So he couldn't figure that out, and it would happen even after a heavy dew sometimes. Um, he said his wife saw a female apparition in the house uh, at least once, so he, he and his wife firmly believed the place was haunted. Um, before him, in the early 80s, there was a couple there with the last name German, G-E-R-M-A-N-N, -N, Andy German and his wife. And they had a lot of stuff happen. And uh, one, one incident was um, one night, uh, Andy, uh, they were about to go to bed. Andy went outside, he had to take care of something. He told his wife he'd be right back. She stayed in the bedroom, in the bed. And she said, she later told him that as, after he left, in the bed next to her, she saw very distinctly a shape moving around the bed as if somebody was, was in the bed. But nobody was there. I think it's about as creepy as you can get. Yeah. Um, and uh, Andy told her later that after he, when he left the bedroom, he saw what he described as like a gray figure move through the hall, from the hall, through the wall into the bedroom. And the timing of that seemed to correspond with what she experienced in the bed. Now, why he didn't tell her about that right away, I'm not sure. But that's their, <laughs> that's their business. But anyway, so they they had a lot of stuff, a lot of weird stuff happen there. When they were going to move out, this, the next family moving in was the Grahams right here. Gerard Graham and his wife Debbie and their little daughter Claire here. The Germans told them the place is haunted. They said, especially one bedroom upstairs. They said, you don't want to use that bedroom. It's the most haunted part of the house. The Grahams thought it was a big joke. They made that bedroom their daughter Claire's bedroom. <laughs> she was, I think, two when they moved in. Uh, and as it turned out, the entire time they lived there for a couple of years, she had an imaginary friend who she still remembers as an old sea captain. <laughs> an old sea captain. <laughs> one story is that late at night, one night, uh, they were in bed, and Claire, who I think was three at the time, came into their bedroom and woke them up and said, fog's rolling in, time to put the horn on. Oh. Three-year-old. They had never talked about anything like that to her. Oh, they couldn't figure out where she got it. So the, the, all they could think of was the sea captain told them. So Debbie, Debbie emailed me about maybe 12 years ago and said oh, they love living there. But she said, oh, by the way, do you know it's haunted? Um, so I, I was contacted by a producer from the Travel Channel who was doing a show on haunted lighthouses of America. And I suggested Owl's Head as one of the lights. And they did include it in the show. And they flew Debbie up from Florida to be in it. I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's been on the Travel Channel many times. Even though it's 10 years old, they still rerun it once in a while. So I got interviewed for it. I'm, I'm in the show. Not only was I interviewed, but I also got to play the lighthouse ghost in some scenes. That's not me in the shot. This is actually the father-in-law of the Coast Guard officer who was living in the keeper's house at the time. And he, he experienced some weird stuff. He said one night he was in bed upstairs, and the bed started vibrating like crazy. He said it wasn't windy, it wasn't a storm, nothing else was shaking except the bed he was in. He just laughed. He thought it was funny. I'm not so sure I'd feel the same way. <laughs> but anyway, so he's got to wear the uniform for this shot. But there are some parts of the show where I'm wearing the uniform. You see me from behind looking out to sea as the mysterious keeper. So if you ever see the show, the mysterious keeper looking out to sea is me and the shadow moving up the wall with the uniform on and one shot is, is me. So that was a lot of fun. I spent a week with the, the crew, basically. Um, but anyway, Alice just has so many stories. This picture was emailed to me maybe a year or so ago by a guy named Bob D'Amato, I believe from Connecticut. And he had just visited Alsed Light, and he said he took this picture from the lighthouse, obviously at night, 
um, looking down the stairs there. This is the oil house here. And the interesting part of the picture is right next to the flagpole here, right mm -hmm. here. And I'm going to show you a cropped, zoomed in uh, version of that. There it is. Oh my God. Wow. Now, he swore to me that there was not a person down there. He said he didn't notice this until he got home and looked at it more closely. It sure looks like a man standing there. Mm -hmm. um, like a transparent man standing yeah. there. And uh, I've had photographers look at this and you know nobody can figure out, there's no normal photographic explanation for this. Um, if a person moved, it would be more of a blur, but it's actually very distinct. It's just that you can see through it. You know what I mean? Um, so your guess is as good as mine. I think it's, a, it's, I think it's one of the most interesting pictures I've seen ever. <laughs> um, this lighthouse has one of the most famous lighthouse ghost stories of any lighthouse in New England. Seguin Light is at the mouth of the Kennebec River, uh, cutting near Booth Bay Harbor and Bath in that area. You can see it from Popham Beach if anybody's been there. Um, and it's 200 feet above the water. Here's what the island looks like. Um, and it has the, uh, the only first order Fresnel lens, which is the biggest kind of lens that they made. The lens is about nine feet tall. Beautiful lens, still in use in that lighthouse. And a nonprofit, Friends of Seguin Island, maintains it. They have seasonal caretakers out there. But it has a very, very famous ghost story. And I'm, this is another story I'm going to tell you with no guarantee that it's a true story. But it's a famous legend, so I'll tell you the way it's usually told. They say that around uh, mid, middle 1800s, a keeper went out to live there with his wife. And there's a common theme here. His wife became very bored, which is easy to believe. <laughs> And the wife, the keeper's wife, asked for a piano to help pass the time. So the keeper bought his wife a piano. They had a, a schooner, a crew and a schooner, bring the piano out to the island, and they carried it up that steep path up to the keeper's house and put the piano in the house for the woman. They say that along with the piano, she was only given one piece of sheet music. <laughs> Some popular song of the day. So she learned how to play that one song, but it was all she knew how to play. It was all the music she had. So she would play that one song over and over and over and over and over <laughs> and so on. And to the point that it drove her husband insane from hearing that same song over and over again. They say he, he, there was an axe for chopping wood. He grabbed the axe, proceeded to chop up the piano, then proceeded to murder his wife and kill himself. So the story goes. Uh, and the song? I don't know what the character is. I don't think we want to know. There are some versions, there are some versions of the story that will name the song, but I don't think it's even a real song. But there, you'll see titles, but I, I don't buy, buy into that so much. But anyway, they say that ever since then, if you're on the, if you're on the island on a calm day uh, and you listen really closely, you're likely to hear soft piano music in the breeze and hear that same song playing over and over again. I never put a lot of stock into this because, again, there's no record of any of that happening. If, it, if there was a murder-suicide, the keeper and his wife, that would have made newspapers. There'd be some sort of record of it. There isn't. But um, I have talked to people who swear they've heard that piano music, including a woman I met a few years ago. We were on a Coast Guard boat going to some lighthouses. She worked for the GSA, General Services Administration, in Boston. And she said that a few days before, she, she visited Seguin Island for the first time. She said that as she was walking around, she very, very distinctly heard pretty piano music. Mm -hmm. She said, she described it as sounding like a memory, which is a very interesting way to describe music. Mm -hmm. She went to the caretaker on the island. She said that it was really pretty who was playing the piano. And he said, there's no piano here. Nobody was playing any music of any kind. He must have heard the ghost. Mm -hmm. So she, she had never heard the piano story, never heard the ghost story mm -hmm. before she was there, yeah. but she heard piano music. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard about you know, supposedly lobstermen passing by, we'll hear the music drifting from the island and so forth. Um, there are people who say that the story really happened, but it happened on another island near Seguin and not on Seguin Island. So there may be a kernel of truth in there somewhere, it may have happened somewhere, but it's, you know, I don't think we'll ever know for sure what the basis of fact mm -hmm. for that one is. So, a couple more to tell you about here. Mm -hmm. Boone Island Light, you familiar with Boone Island? Just mm -hmm. Boone, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. This is one of my favorite lighthouses. It's far from the prettiest. <laughs> yeah. It's probably the opposite of pretty, but uh, I'm fascinated by it. I wrote a book on Maine lighthouses, and I wrote the longest chapter on this one. I'm fascinated by the fact that families lived on this little pile of rocks all year round for many years. Um, the long, this lighthouse was built in 1855. There was a lighthouse there since 1811. But long before there was, a, almost 100 years before there was a lighthouse there, um, there was a very famous, actually a little over 100 years before a lighthouse, there was a very famous shipwreck on the island. Mm -hmm. December 1710, you can see you know about this, the Nottingham Galley, 
Very famous ship, famous partly because a novel was based on it, Boone Island by Kenneth Roberts. It was a very popular historical novelist. He wrote it in the, it was his last book, I think 1956. Basic story is that the Nottingham Galley was a ship from England with Captain John Dean, who was quite prominent, and uh, there were eight, uh, 14, 14 men on board and all. They picked up some cargo in England and Ireland, uh, they picked up cargo in Ireland, some cheese and rope and so forth, and came over to, to head for Boston. And they were wrecked in a sleet storm at Boone Island in the middle of the night. And <clears throat> amazingly, everybody survived the wreck, but they were stranded there. Even though they were within sight of land, only six miles away, they had no way of getting, you know, getting attention. Their ship was completely gone. They were only able to salvage a little bit of sail. They were able to stitch together a little, little, enough sail so they could all crowd in together and wrap the sail around them. That's all the cover they had. They had no food. They had salvaged a few little bits of cheese. They had a few mussels. They killed one seagull. But basically, they had no food. And 10 of them survived about a month on the island through harsh winter weather. It's incredible. Two of them died trying to get to shore on a raft. Two others died on the island. And those of you who know the story may know that the ones who survived resorted to extraordinary measures. And I probably don't need to go into a whole lot of detail about that. But it's a, this, re, this relates to another story I'm going to tell you in a minute. But it's, it's one of the most famous shipwrecks in New England history. Um, Skipping ahead to the 1970s, uh, these two guys were Coast Guard keepers there in the early 70s, and Bob Edwards and Bob Roberts. And I spoke with Bob Roberts on the phone uh, some years ago, and he told me that he, he didn't believe in ghosts when he first went out there. He said that the other Coast Guard guys there asked him if he believed in ghosts, and he laughed. He thought they were joking, and, and they said, you're not going to be laughing for long after you're, <laughs> after you're here for a while. So. He, did, he told me he did come to believe the place was haunted. For one thing, he said that when he would go out at night to tend the foghorn, he felt somebody was watching him, and the other guys would tell him that's where all the cannibalism took place. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but anyway. He also said an interesting story. Um, he and Bob Edwards, these two guys, went out probably in this same boat you see here. They went out fishing one afternoon. And he said they went farther from the island that they had planned on, and they realized they had to rush back to light the light at sunset. So they were rushing back. And as they're coming back, uh, near sunset, the light came on by itself, apparently. Mm -hmm. They landed. There was nobody there. There was no sign of anybody there. They never figured out who lit the light that night. So who knows? Uh, there are other stories as well. One of the Coast Guard keepers told me that their dog used to act like it saw something and it would chase something around that nobody else could see. Um, the story's about a sad-faced woman who supposedly haunts the, the island seen wandering on the rocks. She, the legend is that she was the wife of a keeper who died out there, and she was found. She, had, she went mad, and they eventually found her wandering the rocks out there, and she died. I'm not, I don't think that's a true story, but it's a pretty famous legend. But I'm going to move on. I've got two more lighthouses to tell you about. They're both New Hampshire lights. Uh, I live in Portsmouth, so these are local lighthouses for me. White Island Light is at the southernmost of the Isles of Shoals, uh, and uh, the only offshore lighthouse in New Hampshire. We have one offshore and one mainland lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And the Isles of Shoals uh, have a famous legend to do with Blackbeard the pirate. This is Blackbeard. Uh, and the story, as it's usually told, is that Blackbeard... <laughs> like clock, there you go. Every 15 minutes. Yeah. Blackbeard the pirate supposedly spent time in the Isles of Shoals. There's no proof of this. No, I, I'm not convinced that he really did spend time on the islands there. For those of you, I don't know if you all know the Isles of Shoals. It's a group of nine yeah. islands about six miles offshore yeah. near Rye and Portsmouth and actually divided between New Hampshire and Maine, partly in New Hampshire, partly in Maine. And White Island is in New Hampshire at the southern end. But anyway, they say that Blackbeard spent time there and they say that he uh, at one point left a young bride there, this teenage girl he had married at sea, and he left her there with his treasure. Some versions say White Island, some say Smutty Nose or Lunging Island or some of the other islands, Star Island, different versions. Some say it was the first mate of Blackbeard, not Blackbeard at all, but there's variations. But anyway, they say he left her there, and he said he would return. Uh, he did not. He was killed off the coast of North Carolina, and they say that this young woman died there and is still seen wandering whichever island, you know, it's attached to different islands, but this woman in white is seen wandering out there saying he, sh he, sh he will come back or he will return. Um, and uh, some of you might know Star Island in the Isles mm -hmm. of Shoals has a conference center. Unitarian Universalist yep. Church runs the conference center. And the traditional thing to say when people are leaving the island, the, the young people who work out there always say, you, you will come back. And that relates to this, this uh, legend. 
So, I'm not saying that's a true story, but there are many, many people who swear they've seen a woman in white wandering various islands out there in the Isles of Shoals. This uh, crew is the Coast Guard crew uh, who automated the light, left there in 1986 when the light was automated. Um, and a little bit before them, in the earlier 80s, there was a Coast Guard keeper there named Glenn Young, who lives in York, Maine now. And he, after he left White Island, became a caretaker at Star Island. And he took this picture from Star Island during a storm. That light is 82 feet above the water, so that's a big wave there. Um, the power of storms out there is pretty incredible. In fact, in uh, April 07, we had a big nor'easter, you might remember, and that completely destroyed this walkway between the house and tower that was rebuilt last year. But anyway, Glenn Young told me that when he was out there uh, at White Island, he, um, whenever a storm was coming in, he would go in that walkway he would hear a woman's voice. He swore to me he knows, knew there wasn't a woman on the island. He also knew he wasn't hearing the wind. He absolutely swears it was a woman's voice. He said it always sounded like she was warning in some way. He couldn't make out the words, but it sounded like a warning. That's what it felt like. Um, and he said he heard that on multiple occasions. Um, in the blizzard of 19, I'm gonna tell you a video here. This is silent. Um, and this is uh, taken during the blizzard of 1978 by one of the Coast Guard keepers in the keeper's house. <laughs> Now, and it's pretty poor quality, but it, it helps tell the story. Um, these waves are coming up probably a good 30 to 40 feet above the normal height of the water coming up onto the island. Uh, and they're moving a storage shed around uh, near the boathouse there. So, um, uh, a guy I, I know by the name of Tom Dutton, a Coast Guard officer who lives in Hawaii now, was good friends with one of the young men who was one of the keepers at White Island in the blizzard of 78. I'm not sure if he's the same one who took this, this film or not. But anyway, Tom told me that his friend told him that as the storm was coming in, this, this young guy was very apprehensive. He knew a big storm was coming. So he was trying to secure things around the boathouse. And as he was doing that, he swore to his friend Tom that he saw the apparition of a woman in white appear in front of him. And he said that she actually spoke to him and said something to the effect of, everything will be fine. Don't worry or something, you know, everything will be fine. I'm not so sure I'd be reassured by a ghost mm -hmm. appearing and talking to me, but the, I guess he, he felt somewhat reassured by it. And as it turned out, there was damage, but it wasn't that bad. It was actually worse at Boone Island, where they had to rescue the keepers by helicopter. And the house had to be destroyed after that. But anyway, so that's one of the many stories of the, the woman in white in the Isles of Shoals. We have one more lighthouse to tell you about. This is my home base. I live in Portsmouth, and I spent a lot of time at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, which is actually in Newcastle, a little town next to Portsmouth. And I don't want to forget to tell you, oh, I just thought of something else I meant to mention. I'm going to back up a little bit. And I, when I was talking about Owl's Head Light, I meant to mention that um, the, the lighthouse at Owl's Head is licensed to the American Lighthouse Foundation, which takes care of 22 lighthouses and all. And this just uh, was announced last week. The Keeper's House at Owl's Head Light is now going to be the headquarters of the American Lighthouse Foundation. So that was really, really cool news I just, just found out about recently. So, so that's going to be happening. But anyway. Um, Portsmouth Harbor Light is also run by a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation uh, that I founded in 2001. And it's on a Coast Guard station, which kind of complicates things a little bit, but uh, the Coast Guard's been great with us. Uh, they have, Coast Guard has offices in what used to be the Keeper's House here, but we take care of the lighthouse and the walkway here and the oil house there. So um, we open it up every Sunday afternoon, 1 to 5. So if you come from Memorial Day to Columbus Day, basically. So our season's over for this year, but if you come next uh, spring or summer, I hope you can come on a Sunday and tour the lighthouse. And I'm almost always there on Sunday afternoons. This guy, Joshua Card, was the longest serving keeper of Portsmouth Harbor Light, 1874 to 1909, 35 oh. years. Mm -hmm. And he was a local guy from the town of Newcastle, went to sea at 12, which was not unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, very well loved by the uh, community there, very highly respected. His wife died early in his stay there. He was at Boone Island before he was at Portsmouth Harbor Light, by the way. Highest paid lighthouse keeper in the country at Boone Island at $860 a year. Oh. Took a pay cut to $500 a year to work the enforcement oh. harbor lighthouse. I don't blame him. <laughs> Much better place to live. He got some raises, though. But anyway, so very well respected. He, they say the lighthouse was like his baby. He loved to show people around. He's wearing the old civilian U.S. Lighthouse Service uniform in these pictures. You don't, you don't see anything on the lapels here. It's kind of hard to see here. But normally, the lapels of that old uniform would have the letter K on the lapels which of course stood for keeper. But they say when people would ask Joshua Card, what does that K stand for? He'd always tell them it stood for captain. <laughs> <laughs> I know a few of you have heard that yeah. before, but 
Um, so we call him Captain with a K. I think he knew how to spell. I think he liked being called Captain. Um, and that's important for something I'm going to play in a few minutes here. So I'm just planting a seed there. Um, and this is uh, the man in these two pictures is Elson Small, who ended up being the last keeper of Portsmouth Harbor Light. Came there in 1946 with his wife Connie, who you see here. Uh, they had been at Maine lighthouses for 26 years before they went there. They had only lived on islands off the Maine coast. So this is the first place where they lived on the mainland and also the first place that had electricity. So they were thrilled. Connie later on said they went on an electric binge when they moved in there, <laughs> bought appliances and things. Um, they retired, he retired in 1948. Uh, El uh, Elson died in 1960, but Connie went on to do a lot after that. She wrote a book at the age of 85 called The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife. It's a wonderful book about living on lighthouses. Best book I, I can recommend for you. Um, and I got to know Connie in her 90s. Um, she gave over 600 lectures about living at lighthouses and so forth. And in this picture, again, this is me a few hairs ago. <laughs> um, this is uh, 2003. We gave Connie a certificate as an honorary chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. This is Joanne Yetton and Paul Conlon, two of our board members. She's 101 in that picture. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, she was absolutely amazing. She was yeah. an inspiration. Uh, she was so happy to know that people cared about lighthouses. Mm -hmm. And we called her our guiding light. Just a very mm -hmm. optimistic, cheerful person and just a, a real pleasure to know. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about her in a few minutes. Um, OK, so uh, I founded Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse in 2001. And not too long after that, I started hearing stories mostly from the Coast Guard. Because it's on a Coast Guard station there. Uh, they're on the station 24 hours a day. So they said that they would often see shadowy figures walking around the grounds at night. Um, people working in the keeper's house, what used to be the keeper's house, told me that they would sometimes hear footsteps upstairs and nobody was there. There was this one woman who said that happened to her a number of times and she was kind of shaken up by it. I could tell she wasn't joking about it at all, for sure. She thought it was really weird. <laughs> she would check and nobody was there. Um, one of the guys supposedly doing rounds about midnight was walking towards the keeper's house and saw a male figure standing there and started to say, who, you know, who are you or whatever, and that they just disappeared. So there's all these stories. There's also a story of uh, black footprints that appeared on the grounds in the winter a few, some years ago. Uh, one pair of footprints that looked like a man's boots and another pair that looked like a child's black footprints starting on opposite sides of the grounds and meeting in the middle and not going anywhere from there. And they said they couldn't. They're like oily footprints, and they couldn't get them off the ground, but after a couple of days, they just disappeared. So I wish they had told me so I could have seen it at the time, but they didn't. So there's all kinds of stories. So finally, in 2005, we decided to have New England Ghost Project do the first paranormal investigation at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. So that's when I first met Ron Kolick and company. And you know, we now do uh, haunted tours four times a year, that you, where you can take a walking tour of the Portsmouth <coughs> Lighthouse. And, hear more about the ghost stories and so forth. Ron's now on the board of directors of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. So anyway, August 2005. Um, a lot of stuff happened. I, I wish I could, I, I can't, I don't have time to tell you everything, but um, Karen Mossy in the background here, you saw her in the clip before. She, was, again, at that time was the EVP expert, electronic voice phenomena expert of New England Ghost Project. She did this recording I'm going to play for you in the lighthouse late at night um, and you're going to hear, when I play this, you're going to hear Karen's voice first say, who's there? This one's a little on the soft side, so I hope you can all hear it. Let me go ahead and play it. I'll play it again. She feels that, that male, it sounds like a male voice is saying captain or the captain, like really quickly, the captain. It's not a class A, I'd say it's in the class, probably like a class B EVP, but it, I certainly hear captain in that. Okay. Okay, this one is uh, late at night uh, at the top of the lighthouse, Ron Kolek's voice. You're going to hear him saying, do you like us being here? This is more recently. Um, we've done, you know, we've spent a number of nights there, so there's been uh, quite a few investigations. So we'll go ahead and play this one. This one's a lot louder, so get ready. Do you like us being here? I think that's really clear. Do you like us being here? Okay. And before I, I'm going to play a couple more, but before I play them, I just want to say that a number of them, including that one, it sounds like kind of a gruff male voice. I'm one of a few people who's heard a gruff male voice audibly inside the lighthouse that there didn't seem to be an easy explanation for. One afternoon a few years ago, I was giving a tour to a, for a young couple. 
we're at the top of the stairs in that room where you saw them standing around a minute ago. And I was leaning against the ladder that goes up into the lantern, the very top of the tower. And as I was standing there, I heard, hello. That's what it sounded like. And it sounded like there was somebody standing at the top of the stairs, which was maybe four feet to my right. There's a wall between me and the top of the stairs there. So I felt like if I leaned forward and looked, I would have seen somebody standing right there. And I looked, and there was nobody there. We looked all around. We looked all around the lighthouse outside. There was nobody anywhere near there. And when, it, when it happened, I stopped, and I said, did you hear something? The guy said, yeah, I heard a man say hello. His wife didn't hear anything. Um, my wife has been there by herself and heard a male voice. Uh, Ross Tracy, one of our uh, organization, he's the chairman of the group now. He was up painting in the lantern by himself one day, and he had headphones on, listening to music. He thought he heard something, so he took the headphones off, and he heard, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, wow. So he was very skeptical before that. He checked all around, nobody in sight, nobody anywhere near the lighthouse. He decided to pack up the paint and go home. With that. Wow. He's less skeptical now than he used to be. Um, so it's interesting that some of these EVPs sound like a gruff male voice that sounds similar to what I actually heard. But I'm not saying it's the same voice, but it's, it's, it's certainly similar. Um, this one is another, uh, Jim Stonier is now the EVP expert for New England Ghost Project, and he was up in the lantern, the very top of the tower, when he's, you're going to hear him say, I think you should check the light on this one. I think you should check the light. No, Jim, the, that's actually the guy saying, I think you should check the light. The EVP is the voice just oh, after that. Okay. I'll play it again. I think you should check the light. The OK, okay. is the EVP. Okay. <laughs> Sure sounds like okay. Sometimes, I, I tell you, just as a, a kind of a fun habit, when I go in and on a, into the lighthouse or leave, every time I say hi, Captain, or see you later, Captain, and if there's somebody else with me, sometimes I'll say, uh, I'll say hi, hi, Captain, how are you doing? And then I'll, I'll go, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is, I want you to prepare you, because this one is loud. Um, so those of you sitting near the speakers, okay. you might. Um, you're going to hear a conversation going on. They had the recorder resting on the bottom of the lighthouse and, uh, you know, on a shelf. Mm -hmm. And you hear the conversation going on, and then you hear this loud, weird noise, and the people don't react to it because they didn't hear it audibly. Again, it was only heard when the, the recording is played back. So here it goes. We have to communicate. We have to learn. He's run into those before, he calls them screamers. Hmm. That happens once in a while. He's, he, all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, he just hears what sounds like a scream on the recording. And uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't really know a good explanation, but they show up on time. Um, this was recorded in August 2010 by another paranormal group called Sahoygan Paranormal. Uh, they're from Nashua, New Hampshire. And they've done two investigations at Portsmouth Harbor Light. And in this one, we're in the keeper's house late at night up on the second floor. You're going to hear a conversation with some women and me. You'll hear my voice. One of the women says, I, I, she heard something, and then I, I say, I scratch my head, is that what you heard? And just after that, you're going to hear a weird voice, and they feel the voice is saying, Mary, Mary. It was not heard at the time, definitely. And it's really strange, so here goes. What was that noise? I heard it. My camera is closing. Thank you for it. No, it didn't come from your camera. I scratched my head, didn't hear no, that. No, no it, that's but, right. It was more like a high pitch. Did you hear it? Um, I listened to that many times. The first time I heard it, I thought it sounded like a cat, but mm -hmm. um, it, when you listen to it carefully, it really does sound like Mary Mary, and it's hard to tell if it's a male or female voice. It's just really strange, and I know there was nothing remotely like that heard that night, I mean, while we were there. Um, I, there was another EVP I used to play from that night, um, but it's a little hard to hear, so I'm not playing it, but I'll tell you that we were in the lighthouse, and they, they sent me these recordings afterwards, and they, they said that they were sure that nobody had said this at the time, but we're, you hear conversation going on in the lighthouse and suddenly you hear, Jeremy. Oh. And nobody did that at the time, it was wow. only heard in the recording. But well, it's a little faint in the recording, so I don't, I don't play it anymore. Wow. But that freaked me out just a little bit. Yeah. Um, Fort Constitution is right next to Portsmouth Harbor Light, in the aerial picture I showed you before, you can see the outer wall of Fort Constitution. Very historic fort, there's been a fort there since the 1600s. These walls are from 1808. 
There was an explosion there on the 4th of July, 1809. Ten people were killed, including several children. There was an accidental explosion. They were having a 4th of July celebration. The powder blew up by accident. So this is like a broadside they handed out with a poem about that incident. Um, so a horrible thing. And, and uh, this uh, people, uh, Ron Kolick actually feels the fort has more paranormal activity than the lighthouse. There seems to be a lot going on there, and people blame it on that explosion. These two pictures were taken by a woman named Veronica Pollock during one of our nighttime tours a, a few years ago. And it looks like a, this is looking out from inside the fort out towards the Coast Guard station. It was late at night. There was nothing going on in the station, nobody around. Just snapshots of the digital camera. It looks sort of like a mist kind of going in and out of the, the entrance here. And then there's these weird squiggles here. There may be a natural explanation for this. I, I, I showed these at a talk not too long, just like last month. And a guy in the audience said, first of all, he said, I'm not, he said, I'm not skeptical. He said he lived in a haunt, lives in a haunted house. But he said that he believes that this is a natural thing that's actually a form of phosphorescence that comes out of oh. old buildings yeah. sometimes, mm -hmm. especially brick, which may be the case. But I, I don't know. I mean, how does that explain yeah. these weird squiggles yeah. and stuff? Um, maybe. <laughs> I'm not convinced of it, but I'm open to ideas. Um, I showed him to a digital photography expert, and he had no good, good explanation for them. So very interesting. This picture was taken during Sauhegan Paranormal's last investigation last year, and this is out in the grounds of the fort very late at night. Well, actually, it was 9.50, I guess, so not quite 10 o'clock at night. And this woman, th this is something that's happened a number of times where people say they feel a hand on their neck in the fort there. Mm. Uh, I haven't felt it, but I've had some very strong feelings, of, uh, very, very strong feelings in there. But anyway, this woman <clears throat> said she felt a hand on her neck. Just like seconds after she said that, somebody took this picture. And there's something here that looks like it's something right behind her head and like something is touching her neck. I showed this at one presentation a few months ago, and a guy who's written a lot about the paranormal and is open-minded but also kind of skeptical, he got up and he's looking at it really carefully, and he said, that's a moth. He said he, said he felt pretty sure that that was a moth very close to the camera lens. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, if it is a moth or something right in front of the lens, it's an awfully big coincidence that it showed up right where it showed up seconds after she felt a hand on her neck. Wow. That to me is an awfully big coincidence. That's kind of hard, hard to, you know, you can draw your own conclusions on that. Um, I'm almost done here, but I'm going to play you a quick clip from a Ghost Hunter show on the Sci-Fi Channel that when they did a show at Portsmouth Harbor Light. This was four years ago, last month. Hard to believe it's that long ago. I got to be the client in the show, so I showed them around and everything. This is a part of the show. It was, in, I think it was something like 2 a.m. The two young women here, this is Amy and the other one's Chris, they're at the top of the stairs in the lighthouse, and they were doing some knocking on the walls, and they were getting responses from down below that seemed to be imitating the knocks. And this is picking it up right after that happened. So here goes. Hi. Captain, can you please come up here? Is that? That was on the stairs. We were just hearing what sounded like footsteps up and down the stairs. I was honestly ready to fall off my chair because I couldn't believe I heard what I heard. I can't think of anything that would explain why it sounds like there's somebody going up and down those stairs mm -mm. when there's just us. Like I, I'm, I'm thinking that if there was he's on the stairs again. I wish he would come up here and like do more sounds like closer. Right now it sounds like he's. Oh my god. <gasps> oh my god. He's walking up the stairs. Dude, somebody's walking up the stairs. Holy baby. Holy that sounds like it was like five steps down. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I will say that um, there have been other investigations. Uh, people have heard all kinds of things in there. Usually people don't react so much, but it, it's TV, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think they're yeah. told to play up their reactions. It's good mm. for TV. So anyway, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah. Um, there's Connie Small again, and I'm gonna, I just want to finish with a little story. Um, I, I told you about Connie. I told you she was 101 in that picture before, and she, in this picture too. She's 101 there. 
She passed away at 103 in February of 2005. Wow. Um, it was six months after that the New England Ghost Project came and did the first ever investigation of Portsmouth Harbor Light, August of 2005. Um, about 12.30 a.m. after midnight, we were up on the second floor of the Keeper's house. Maureen Wood, the, the trans medium I showed you before, was there. And she had never met any of us before that night. She had never heard of Connie Small and nothing about the place. Anyway, she was standing in this little kitchen area on the second floor of the house, and she, first she said there's a woman there, she said it's kind of a weak presence, and now she's gone. And then she said there's somebody else here, and it's much stronger. And then she suddenly, everything changed, and she started speaking as if she was somebody else. And she started speaking as if she was an old woman. She started speaking in like a halt, halting kind of voice, and she said, um, said I want to thank someone. Ron Kolick was standing right next to her, he said, oh, is it me? And she said, no. And he said, oh, be that way, or something. And I was standing maybe, a whole bunch of us are crowded in a small area, so I was behind some other people. And Ron said, is it Jeremy you want to thank? And she said, yes. And she said, I want to thank you for the gift in a very halting way. As this was happening, part of me is thinking, you know, feeling very skeptical, and I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. It's not like Connie speaking to me. But another part of me really felt emotionally like it was her speaking to me. Um, it didn't go on much longer. She repeated those things a couple of times. It only went on for a couple of minutes. That's often the case. And then Maureen fell on the floor, which is usually what she does when she does this channeling. She'll fall like a sack of potatoes, like boom, on the floor. It's not like fainting. It's just, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. But she was okay. Ron's, Ron's theory about that is that it's like there's nobody home for a few seconds, and it takes a little while for Maureen to kind of be back in charge of things again. Mm -hmm. So I saw her when she opened her eyes, and it looked like somebody coming from a million miles away from another planet or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they helped her up. They went downstairs. I stayed upstairs by myself for a little bit longer. Uh, a few minutes later, uh, Roxy, uh, one of our volunteers, came upstairs. Mm -hmm. And she was a little shaken up. And she said to me, she said, you won't believe what Maureen just said to me. Maureen said to Roxy, Connie wants to thank you for the big pink flowers. Mm. Now, at Connie's funeral six months earlier in South Berwick, Maine, there was an open casket in the front of the church. I, was, I left the church, you know, I was one of the last ones out, but Roxy and her husband, Ken, were the last ones out of the church. Roxy had a bouquet of pink tulips. Mm -hmm. They went up to the casket, the minister said, if you want to put those in the casket, go ahead and do that. Roxy put the flowers in there. Nobody knew that but Roxy and her husband and the minister. Six months later, Maureen, who had never met any of us, who never heard of Connie Small before that night, out of the blue said to Roxy, Connie wants to thank you for the big pink flowers. Oh, wow. Wow. So, and then a little while later, Maureen said to me and Roxy, Connie wants to thank you for being at her funeral, which is an odd wow. thing to be told by somebody. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> not, none of this wow. is proof of anything. You know, yeah. people, a lot of people are going to be skeptical no matter what. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I entered that night feeling skeptical about a lot of it and came out less skeptical after that mm -hmm. night. Um, it's pretty hard to explain that away in easy, easy terms. Mm -hmm. So That's about it. And I appreciate you. your, your attention. If any, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, has any questions. Yes? Now, when Maureen comes out of this, does she doesn't have any recollection of what she's heard until she watches Usually kind of vaguely. She, doesn't, she often forgets. She doesn't remember a lot of it. So, like... She and Ron Cullock co-wrote a book called Ghost Chronicles, and Ron had to fill in a lot of what happened when Maureen was channeling because she didn't remember a lot of it. Right, because I heard her say to me when she was going home the next morning that they watched the, to see what it was. The second was the second White House. Uh huh. Um, yeah, she. Uh, it's, it's often like sort of hazy. You know, she'll she'll remember general impressions and stuff, but she also often, often doesn't remember the specifics of what she said or anything like that. I've seen her say some really interesting stuff. We did an investigation at a restaurant in Kittery mm -hmm. last year, and she, I couldn't play her uh, what she said that night in Nick's company. There used to be like a sailor's club. <laughs> so you can just imagine. It's pretty wow. salty. <laughs> but she, it was like, was a Maureen? She was walking with a limp. She was like, a, she had a cane. Oh my God. And she was talking about having been knifed by somebody, and she was just swearing at this person who knifed her. And it was really weird. I mean, it was just out of the blue. Anyway. Sure, I can turn the light on. Any other questions? Yes, on the, I have another one. The first, first one that you showed us, yeah. the five people that were in the canoe that died, yeah. you mentioned there was another child 
on the island. Right. Did, was there ever any mention of what happened to that kid? Um, <laughs> she was with a friend and they watched the whole thing happen from the island. Um, but I don't know, you know, her parents died, so I don't know what happened to her after that. But I know that she watched the. She incident. watched it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to refresh my memory and your memory. I was with you and Ron Kolek when we did the investigate the paranormal investigation at Portsmouth Harbor Light. Right. I'm trying to, I know you were. I know you've you been part of that, but I'm trying to remember where, when, when that. Which it was one? Last, it was last year, maybe in August. Okay. It was a, well, a year ago. The, August. What we call the ghost hunt, right? Which we don't do anymore. But no, I, it, or was we it had, of, at the uh, fourth <laughs> and. But was it what we? Where we had the, you paid to take part in the yeah, yeah there were about ten of us in the group or so yeah and we were in the area where the where the the Fourth of July mm -hmm. murders not murders but the explosion, explosion there yeah. and my camera suddenly stopped working and there was another gentleman in our group that his camera suddenly stopped working and I had just put fresh batteries in my camera that night right I think I remember you telling me this before and the other gentleman yeah. in the group and then we walked over to the lighthouse. And because I was upset, I wanted to take pictures of the light at night. I'd never seen the, the light in, in the evening or mm -hmm. nighttime. Yeah. We walked over to the lighthouse and the, our, both of our cameras started working again. It was just so, it was just... Other people, a lot Ron, of people have had some Ron said that had happened to other people. Yeah, it definitely has. Show. Yeah, I've seen it happen a yeah. number of times. But, but on the Isle of Shoals, there were, there were murders on the Isle of Shoals. Mm -hmm. well, there was, was, was a famous murder on Smutty Nose, the mm -hmm. 1873, mm -hmm. the... Um, mm -hmm. The two sisters, yes. were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Norwegian. Um, mm -hmm. So that's so that, they that could has ghost stories of its own. But yeah, they could have been I'm talking more about the ghost yeah. stories that relate to the lighthouses. But there's, you know, I, I gave this talk oh, yeah. on Halloween day at a, a, a place in Massachusetts, and a couple of people asked, "How come just lighthouses?" They thought that I, they, they had the. They, they had the impression that I was saying that only lighthouses have these stories. Oh, Obviously, oh, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. It's you know, uh, if you if, if you believe in any of this at all, you know, why shouldn't every place be haunted? Basically, and it seems like almost every old building has some sort of story to it. Who was the speaker we had earlier, Diane? Jeff Belland. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Well, I know Jeff. Yeah. Oh, he's great. He he spoke. Uh, when was it? For first part of October. Yeah. Oh, yeah. October first. Yeah. yeah. He's a very interesting guy. Yeah, Jeff's just new yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. His show is on the travel net. Yeah. He's involved with Ghost Adventures, right? Ghost yeah, it's on the tra yeah. travel channel. Not Ghost Adventures, but Ghost Adventures. Yeah, he's one of the writers, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has some clips uh -huh. of different places, too. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's never done an investigation with us at a lighthouse or anything, but we've, he and I have spoken at some of the same yeah. events. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. check out New England Ghost Project. There's some interesting stuff on there. Ron always has events going on, some really interesting events. He lives in Dracut, and a lot of his events are not too far from here. Um, and uh, my website, New England Lighthouses, my tour site, American Lighthouse Foundation, and again, Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, open every Sunday afternoon, 1 to 5 in summer, and we have other events as well, so I hope I'll see some of you there sometime. And I have some of my books here, uh, my Lighthouse Handbook, New England. I don't have any book on ghost stories, but I do have, yet anyway, Ron and I may be writing one. Um, I do have my book on Oceanborn Mary, um, which is a famous New Hampshire legend that's partly a ghost story. And it was a very fascinating thing to work on. And a book on Maine shipwrecks as well. Um, so the, there are 15, except the Oceanborn Mary one is 20, if anybody's interested in the signed copy. Thank you. Glad, I, glad this finally happened. Thanks, Matt. I just wanted to um, let you all know about the next two Mondays. Um, next Monday, we'll be having Kate Carney coming, and she will be doing, um, she does historical presentations, and she'll be dressed in costume for the Lowell um, boarding housekeeper. Lowell Mills boarding housekeeper, oh. and that will be at the town hall at 6.30 on Monday. And the following week, we will have Lee Thomas coming to do his presentation on the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, which will be a little bit different than the one he did in August, if anyone had gone to that.